Hello, and welcome back to This Month on the Railroad, my monthly series covering railroad news from around North America. For today's episode, we'll be covering news from February of 2023. First off, though, let me quickly mention a story from late January. On January 25th, the Maine Department of Transportation put a $3 million plan into motion to create a light commuter rail service between Brunswick and Rockford, effectively expanding the Amtrak Downeaster route 56 miles to the north. This funding will be used to upgrade two Finger Lakes Railway RDC cars for future service. Eventually, these two self-propelled cars will serve Rockland, despite the fact that they were originally built in the late 50s. This is definitely a promising project for the state of Maine, and a cost-effective idea for creating affordable passenger rail in other places too. Anyway, now into February. On the 2nd, Alstom and the government of Quebec announced a plan to bring the Caradia Island, a hydrogen fuel cell multiple unit, to North America. This summer, this train will enter service on the Rousseau-Charlevoix rail network, testing the viability of this alternative fuel in North America. While I've mentioned previous hydrogen equipment projects, like Aero's Stadler equipment, this Alstom train will be the first of its kind to enter service in North America, once again making its debut later this year. On the 3rd, as everyone and their mom knows at this point, a Norfolk Southern freight train derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, spilling vinyl chloride, a toxic chemical used in the production of PVC pipes and other polyvinyl products. Like the rail strike news from a few months ago, this derailment, because of its devastating effects on this small Ohio town, made national headlines once again bringing operations of Class 1 freight railroads into question. I usually don't mention derailments because they happen all the time, but since this one had such a major place in the public consciousness, I do think it's worth mentioning. Luckily, this incident has sparked conversations scrutinizing how American freight railroads operate, which I think is very good. Freight railroads are the backbone of this country, and if they continue to be as dysfunctional as they are now, everyone will suffer. A few days later, on the 7th, the final Brightline Florida train set departed the Siemens Mobility Plant in Florin, California with a four-car train in addition to a spare locomotive. Like the last few deliveries, it was sent to the new shops in Orlando, Florida, where it'll enter service later this year. The next day, the Ohio Rail Development Commission moved forward in applying for federal grants to begin studying the viability of intercity rail within the state. Similar to the Amtrak Connects Us map, two corridors are being considered, those being Cleveland to Cincinnati and Cleveland to Detroit. This is the first step in the long process of creating these routes, but the FRA's Corridor Identification and Development Program will most likely be able to provide the state with $500,000 per corridor for viability studies. On the 9th, a new commuter rail service was proposed between Sacramento and Chico, California, under the name North Valley Rail. This is just the beginning of a new project, but if it's approved and funded by local and state government, it could be in service as early as 2028. On the 14th, a new press release from Brightline laid out a plan to start service between Orlando and Miami, Florida as early as quarter two of this year. While this is a far cry from the original plan to start testing the new Orlando line by Christmas, this new quarter two target seems pretty realistic as testing officially began on the 125 mile per hour Orlando line on March 1st. The next day, sticking with the theme of Brightline, new renderings were released for the Brightline West project connecting Los Angeles to Las Vegas by an 180 mile per hour electrified high speed rail service. Now seen in a similar yellow paint scheme to Brightline's trains in Florida, this would appear to be a Siemens Valaro Novo train set, which even says Siemens on the side. This pretty much confirms that Siemens Mobility will be the provider of equipment for Brightline West, because why else would the rendering say Siemens on it? Either way, construction is planned to begin later this year, with FRA approval expected in late March. On the 20th, Chicago Commuter Rail Metra announced that it had failed to reach an agreement with Progress Rail to convert F40 diesel locomotives to battery electric power, meaning that the process will have to start all over again. From what I've heard, Progress Rail seemed to be the only party interested in rebuilding these engines, so Metro will definitely have a hard time finding another manufacturer. I guess we'll see what happens, but hopefully, soon Metro will realize that retrofitting 40-year-old locomotives with a brand new, unproven technology is not the best idea. On the 21st, a new MBTA Orange Line car was stranded on I-495 in Chelmsford, Massachusetts after the trailer it was on disconnected from the semi. My question is, why would the MBTA choose to ship its new rail cars by truck when the factory they're being built at has a rail connection? It probably wouldn't be that hard to load these cars onto flat cars and ship them on CSX via Worcester. I'm sure there's a reason why I like clearance issues, but still, perhaps this truck fiasco will make the MBTA reconsider. Two days later, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority awarded a contract to Alstom to build 130 new trolleys for its light rail lines. 
these honestly really cool looking cars will begin to be delivered in 2027, replacing 1980s era Kawasaki cars. Alstom says that these new cars will be fully ADA compliant, more reliable, and more efficient than the outgoing cars, and as an added bonus, they look really cool, unlike the MBTA's recent order for the Green Line. On the 27th, the Long Island Railroad began full service to Grand Central Madison, which unfortunately didn't go as smoothly as expected. The LIRR experienced significant delays over the week, but regardless, thousands of passengers used this new station. Staying in the New York City area, on the 28th, a Metro North M8 was spotted in Penn Station testing clearances, weight limits, and compatibility with the Amtrak Hellgate line. This is the earliest sign that the new Penn Station access project is moving along. Finally, on the 28th, RNCX F59PH number 1859 debuted on the Amtrak Piedmont testing new rail propulsion systems emissions technology. This F59 is the first of its kind to achieve a tier 4 emissions rating from the EPA, which if proven reliable will greatly extend the life of this locomotive. And with that, we're on to March, hopefully another month full of exciting news. Before I go though, if you want more content from me, consider getting a channel membership. For just $1 a month, you can gain access to exclusive updates, videos, and other surprises. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon in another video.